I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. 28 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate the following letter has been received from Senator Stirl. Pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The need for the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services to apologise to Victorians for claiming a very positive record across the board with respect to maintaining a safe border for Australia at the same time as Victoria faced new COVID outbreaks because of the Morrison government's failure to implement and maintain safe national quarantine. Is the proposal supported? It is. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's discussion, and with the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. I'll let people vacate the chamber, and then I will call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. Well, this Morrison government has failed Victorians. They have failed. They have had months to prepare Australia to safely deal with the ongoing impact of the pandemic. They've had months to effectively roll out the vaccine. They've had months to get safe national open-air quarantine facilities up and running. And have they? No. Throughout this pandemic, the Morrison government has denied its responsibility for quarantine. It has failed to set appropriate national standards for quarantine. And all the while, they sit back and critique state government responses to breaches in hotel quarantine. Prime Minister Morrison said on hotel quarantine back in April, a system that is achieving 99.99 per cent effectiveness is a very strong system and is serving Australia very well. How did he come to that conclusion and that figure? 21 breaches from hotel quarantine in this country. Tens of thousands of infections in this country more than 800 tragic deaths in this country. Does that sound like a system that is serving Australia well? It sounds like a system that is dangerously struggling to keep up. So when will the Morrison government get it? Hotels are built for tourists and for short stays. Hotels are not built for virus control. And this government was told in October by their own hand-picked adviser, Jane Holton, that they needed to build fit-for-purpose open-air quarantine facilities. That was seven months ago. The Victorian government handed them a proposal for a new purpose-built quarantine facility back in April. And when did Prime Minister Morrison finally agree to build a facility in Victoria? In June, in June, when Victorians were already battling with new outbreaks of more failures of the hotel quarantine system, this time from Adelaide. This government just does not think ahead. They don't plan. And when they are finally dragged kicking and screaming to act, it is already too late. So according to this Prime Minister, the vaccine rollout, it's not a race. MRNA vaccine manufacturing starting in four years' time? That's fine. Purpose-built quarantine facilities? They can wait. The states are just welcome to give us their proposals. Financial support for casual workers in crisis in Victoria? They can wait too. They can wait a week without pay, and you'll have to drag us kicking and screaming to deliver it. And according to the acting Prime Minister, a week without income? Well, it's not that long to wait anyway. What a heartless response from this government. And this government should be embarrassed and they should be ashamed at the pace of the vaccine rollout in Australia. Embarrassed and ashamed. Victorians, we entered 2021 expecting a fast and efficient vaccine strategy, only to be given the exact opposite by the Morrison government. I was there with all Victorians going through the winter with the virus spreading throughout our community last year. And one of the things that got us through was the hope, the hope of a vaccine on the other side, the hope of effective national quarantine. That is what got us through last year. But here we are again, here we are again facing yet another Victorian winter 
with the virus again trying its best to spread through an almost entirely unvaccinated population. Because today, less than 3 per cent of Australians are fully vaccinated. Less than 3 per cent. Let that sink in. And we are currently 4.2 million doses behind the government's current vaccination target. Not their first target, not their second target, behind their third target. They just keep dropping the bar lower and lower, and still they are missing the mark. They still can't tell us how many aged care workers have been vaccinated. They still can't tell us when aged care workers will be vaccinated. And the health minister, Mr Hunt, is not even sure whether he wants us to be vaccinated. One day he's telling over 50s to get AstraZeneca. The next he's saying they can wait for Pfizer until the end of the year. Well, which is it? Which is it? You could not make this stuff up. You couldn't make it up. Australians, and especially Victorians, had to dig deep to get through last year. Victorians sacrificed so much to beat this virus back. And they should have been able to come into 2021 with confidence that this government had learned the lessons of 2020, that it would have a real plan that ensured Australians would be able to beat this, this virus and that they would be safe, that people wouldn't be sitting ducks waiting for the next outbreak to hit that we would be vaccinated, that quarantine would now be safe. But the Morrison government, it has failed Victorians because it is impossible for a federal government to deal with a pandemic if they don't actually believe in governing. It is impossible for a federal government to deal with a pandemic if they don't want to roll up their sleeves, if they wait time and again to be dragged kicking and screaming to do anything to do something. It doesn't work. The Morrison government's approach doesn't work. They have left Victorians exposed, they have left Australians exposed, and it doesn't have to be this way. If only the government believed in actually governing, if only they believed in taking responsibility, if only they would act instead of just react. It is a race. It is a race, and it isn't a case of slow and steady wins the race. So it is time for this government to pick up the pace, to get moving, to get on with the job of building fit-for-purpose quarantine facilities in every state and territory, to start a public health campaign and ramp up the vaccine rollout with some urgency. There is no room for more excuses from this government. The Prime Minister needs to step up and do his job because actually lives depend on it. And until this government does step up, all of the hard work that Australians put in to get our country moving again, all of that hard work last year in 2020 into this year, it is just waiting to be thrown away. Now, Labor. Labor knows that if we are to beat this virus and to keep Australians safe, there can be no more delays. There can be no more delays. Labor would build dedicated quarantine facilities in every single state and territory. We would fix this bungled, bungled vaccine rollout. We would start a mass public health campaign around vaccines. Where is the public health campaign around vaccines? And we would make it a first priority to manufacture more vaccines right here in Australia. It's the only path forward towards a real recovery that leaves Australians secure in getting on with their lives. But all of this, apparently, it just seems like it's too much work for the Morrison government. They would rather sit back and be reactive instead of be proactive, deal with it once the damage is already done. Don't, ha don't hold the hose. Don't take responsibility. Don't admit fault. They should feel real shame for what Victorians have been going through the last few weeks. Real shame. They should look at the evidence and see what their repeated failure has done, their inability to take responsibility and actually run this country, take us through the pandemic, is actually hurting Victorians and hurting Australians. Real people are impacted by this government's weakness. It is no longer day one of the pandemic. It's been over 500 days since the first COVID case in Australia. The Prime Minister cannot pretend like he doesn't know how this virus moves, 
how infectious it is, how devastating it can be. He needs to wake up and be honest with Australians. He needs to realise how big of a mistake it is every day that we miss the vaccination mark, how big of a mistake it is every day that we wait for a fit-for-purpose open-air quarantine, every day. Prime Minister Scott Morrison and his government might be prepared for Australians to make the sacrifice again and again for their failures, for the Morrison government's failures. But Australians are done. We are done. We want the Morrison government to do the job that they were elected for, and that is to stand up for Australians and to protect Australians. Senator Henderson. I thank you very much. It's my pleasure to rise and speak in this matter of public importance debate about the need to apologise to all Victorians. And I have to say uh, I am incredibly disappointed to hear Senator Walsh's contribution, which I can only say is highly irresponsible, uh, to misrepresent in particular the advice of the Federal Health Minister in relation to the vaccination is a disgrace. And that's what Senator Walsh has just done. And we all have a responsibility in this chamber, no matter which side of politics we are on, to make sure that Australians have accurate information. And for Senator Walsh to get up with that ridiculous spray and say what she did, uh, she should be totally ashamed. And, and this is a, an MPI about the requirements of an apology, and yes, an apology is required, and Victorians have worked it out. An apology is required by the Victorian state government and by federal Labor Victorian M MPs and senators who have stood in silence through four lockdowns as Victorian residents, including Victorian families, businesses, seniors and students, have been brought to the knees as a result of the mismanagement of the pandemic in Victoria by the state Labor government. The fact that Victoria has suffered four debilitating lockdowns, unlike what we have seen in any other state or territory, is, is no coincidence. So to Labor senators in this chamber, I say, please perhaps consider apologising to Victorians for the hotel quarantine fiasco, including the engagement of security guards who had no proper infection control training or expertise, which allowed coronavirus to spread into the community and, of course, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of senior Victorians, and that was the finding of the Cote Inquiry. Apologise perhaps to Victorians for not accepting the offer of help from the Commonwealth, such as the provision of ADF personnel to support the state's quarantine responsibilities. Apologise to Melburnians for the curfew, which effectively locked them in their homes and, and which was without doubt in breach of the Victorian government's Charter of Human Rights. Apologise to the people who lived in the public housing towers in Melbourne who were locked down with no warning whatsoever, leaving parents without food for their children and older residents frightened, which the Victorian Ombudsman found was a clear breach of human rights. Apologise for the Victorian state government's incompetent contact tracing system, and there have been some big improvements, and I am pleased to say that, but it's still a far cry from the gold standard in New South Wales, and it meant that for many months the government ignored the advice of the experts to adopt a unified QR code and check-in system, to adopt proper IT systems and to publish exposure sites so that people could immediately, if they'd visited those sites, isolate and get tested. And perhaps also consider apologising to school students for missing so many weeks of school, to families for not being able to see their loved ones. And, and even now, families in regional Victoria can't visit their loved ones in residential aged care unless they are at end of life. So I say apologise to Victorians for four statewide lockdowns, including the most recent lockdown in regional Victoria, where there has been no community transmission which has resulted in insurmountable financial and mental health pain and which left so many businesses broken or closed when there was no basis to do so, including the IGA supermarket in Anglesey, which was forced to close as a result of a false positive case and which has now suffered losses in excess of $100,000. Perhaps also apologise to our regional tourism and hospitality sector and to regional chambers of commerce and regional committees 
including the committee from the Mornington Peninsula, which are pleading for the state government to put in place a proper COVID-safe response plan so that whenever a positive case arises, it can be dealt with locally whilst allowing the rest of the city and the state to function as happens in New South Wales. The facts are that this latest lockdown has caused such a loss of faith and confidence uh, because it demonstrates that the Victorian government does still not have the capacity to control the virus and the outbreaks locally in any sort of proportionate manner as occurs in other states. So last weekend, the long weekend, uh, the Victorian Chamber of Commerce and Industry estimated that lost visitation and cancelled trips cost regional Victorian business, um, businesses and the visitor economy around $150 million just over three days. And that, of course, was due to unreasonable density caps. Some major tourism businesses, such as Sovereign Hill, could not open. Um, many major businesses were closed, such as Heathcote on show, the Castlemaine Jazz Festival, wineries, restaurants, hotels, cafes, and accommodation providers and other tourist operators were left high and dry. So, acting Madam Deputy President, it is time that the state government worked out how to keep our state's economy open whilst protecting lives and livelihoods. None of these issues, of course, were addressed by Senator Walsh in her contribution. So I want to now move to the facts in relation to the Commonwealth's quarantine responsibilities, and they are very clear. Again, these are facts not acknowledged or even referenced in Senator Walsh's contribution. Mandatory quarantine with COVID-19 testing is currently considered the best strategy for incoming travellers, and it is a key pillar of our nation's response. Hotel quarantine was mandated by National Cabinet on 27 March 2020, and these requirements have been implemented under state and territory legislation with the support of the ADF and Australian Border Force where necessary. Since the implementation of hotel quarantine, there have been 372,000 international air arrivals with some 4,000 COVID positive cases, most of which have been in hotel quarantine. And apart from the major failures which occurred in Victoria, uh, there has been very little other outbreaks. So, in accordance with the resolution of National Cabinet, the Commonwealth is supporting the states and territories. It's supporting, obviously, Northern Territory at the Howard Springs Quarantine Facility. The investment is in excess of half a billion dollars, and that's also supporting our national effort to repatriate Australians flying in um, to Australia, and that is a major incoming port, of course, for all Australians. There's the agreement with Tasmania to support Australians returning there. And then, of course, there's the memorandum of understanding for a quarantine facility in Victoria, and I welcome that. And it is a pity, though, again, Senator Walsh did not reference this, that the state Labor government has proposed an animal quarantine facility at Mickleham as its preferred option. And uh, from where I sit, as a regional senator based in Geelong, that is absurd because that presents a whole range of biosecurity and logistical issues which the state government have not even considered. And that's why I've been such a big supporter of uh, placing this quarantine facility at Avalon Airport, where incoming travellers can fly directly into Avalon uh, to an international terminal, a first-class terminal, and then travel a very, very short distance to their accommodation facility. So even on this issue, it does seem that the Victorian government has not done its basic homework. I do welcome the fact that the Victorian government is open to Avalon, and I'm very confident and I hope that that will be the decision as negotiations continue between the Commonwealth and the state. But this makes great sense for Victoria. It makes great sense for the Geelong region. It would be a huge boost for jobs in our local economy and, of course, would utilise Avalon Airport, which has endured such financial pain over the last 18 months or so. So I say to Labor senators, there's a lot to apologise for in relation to what has happened in Victoria. It has been a very torrid time, and as I say, it's no coincidence that there have been these rolling lockdowns in Victoria, unlike any other state. Uh, I'm really proud of the Morrison government's management of this pandemic, and to a large degree, 
the Morrison government has worked very successfully with the states and territories. Uh, just think of this. More than 12 months ago, it was hard to envisage that we would have a vaccination. That vaccination rollout is happening at a very, very fast pace. We are at total vaccinations of almost 6 million vaccinations. Uh, and that is a great achievement. Uh, yes, there is more hard work to be done. We urge all Australians to get vaccinated, but can, we can be very proud of our efforts together. But I say to the state government in Victoria, please get your act together in relation to the issues for which you are responsible. And I hope and trust that the new quarantine facility in Victoria will be at the wonderful Avalon Airport. Thank you so much. Senator Seward. I rise to speak to this matter of public interest, the need for the Minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care Services to apologise to Victorians for claiming a very positive record across the board with respect to maintaining a safe border for Australia, at the same time as, as Victoria faced new COVID outbreaks because of the Morrison government's failure to implement and maintain safe national quarantine. Now, the reason that the minister has to apologise for this was for the comments that were made, and these comments have been repeated a number of times, about the fact that they have a very positive record. How can you call it a positive record when, during estimates, a document was tabled that documented 21, 21 quarantine breaches? And since then, I don't think that one included the, the another Perth uh, breach, or the one happening right now in New South Wales, quarantine breach. Now, those breaches—23, people may say yes, and the government does say there's been thousands of people coming to Australia. But the point is, look what the impact that one breach had on Victoria just recently wasn't even an escape from a Victorian hotel. It was an escape from— it, came through the South Australian quarantine breach into Victoria, caused the current outbreak, or the outbreak that led to the lockdowns that I noticed today the restrictions are being wound back uh, again, thank goodness for Victorians. But the fact is, one breach has a very, very significant impact, and the Commonwealth knows this. The Commonwealth knows this. So how can they say we have a very positive record when, in fact, there has been a number of breaches? Now, we know hotels are not the right place to be quarantining people. Fair enough. When the pandemic first hit, we had to take immediate action, and hotels were then brought into play. It was important that that happened. But we are now a significant period down the track. We are, still having, we are now having breaches from quarantine which are causing lockdowns. Western Australia has had several, Victoria has had a number, South Australia obviously, and New South Wales and Queensland. That is why we need specialist facilities for quarantining like Howard Springs. No, no leaks or breaches of quarantine in Howard Springs. That's because it has what is necessary to ensure effective quarantining. People in their own space, fre able to get fresh air. No, none of the impact that we're seeing in hotels, which is this issue specifically around ventilation and aerosols. Now, why the government, again in estimates, said we're paying attention to uh, aerosols, there has been a problem since the beginning with aerosols. Yes, they mouth the words. Do they do something about it? No. Problem with getting effective PPE out that deals with aerosols, but specifically the ventilation in hotels for quarantining in a lot of those hotels is not adequate. And they've known that for a long time. But do we have guidelines across Australia around ventilation and aerosols? Guess what? No, we don't. And while I mistakenly believed an answer to one of my questions in the COVID committee was that, yes, they are developing some guidelines around that across the nation, in fact, estimates turn, in estimates, the answer to my question then was how they're proceeding was that, no, they're not actually working on that. 
So we still have no national guidelines on ventilation and ensuring negative pressure in these hotels. And while some while states have moved to try and address this issue, it is still happening. Clearly meaning the Commonwealth needs to be taking action to build special purpose, fit for purpose quarantine facilities because we are going to be dealing with this issue for a significant time into the future. Then that takes me, of course, to the issue around the need for vaccines. Of course, we, have, we are very pleased to see that vaccines have been developed with a lot of effort around the world. But for the government to claim that they are way up there in the rollout of vaccines, that is ridiculous. So the number of targets that we've had and the number of assurances by the government the government missed the target in March. The government missed the target at the, sorry, the beginning of March they missed the target. The end of March they missed the target. In April they missed the target. In January the government announced there'd be 40 million total doses in, at the end of October this year. Missed that target. Well, they've, they've already admitted they're not going to meet that. We now have December, we've seen um, the 40 million uh, dose target has been revised uh, in new, a number of times. We clearly, clearly have missed the mark on vaccinations and specifically in aged care, both for residents but particularly for staff and, and also in uh, disability uh, shared accommodation and group homes. Again, missed the mark for both residents, disabled people and their carers, and in aged care in particular. And we still don't know how many workers have been vaccinated. And the government has contracted this out. And when the first contractor didn't deliver, what did we do? Oh, yeah, we went to another contractor to try and fix the first contractor's failure to actually roll out the doses to meet our targets. This has been, in many instances, in fact, farcical. The number of contracts, the amount of money we have paid, instead of actually making sure that we, the, the public service could do it, that the government could do it, states and territories. The reason so many have now been rolled out is because the state and territories have picked up the slack and set up hubs. They're the ones doing it. So yes, the minister does owe an apology for, com for continuing the myth that they are doing safe border management when we've had so many breaches that have such devastating consequences. Thank you. Senator Seward, I call Senator Polly. Yes, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I want to make a few comments in relation to this MPI. But to start with, I think we have to correct the record. When Senator Henderson, who is typically uh, keeping her, her head in the sand, comes in here and tries to rewrite what's really happening in this country and saying that this is all Victorians' fault. The, the whole pandemic rests with the Victorian state Labor government. Well, what a lot of nonsense. What a lot of nonsense. Then she goes on with some more diatribe, trying to tell us that there's a fast rollout of the vaccine. Well, we know quite clearly that that is not the case. What we do know is there are two facts that we should put on the record which makes it very clear what is happening in this country and why it's happening. Firstly, it's the Commonwealth government responsibility to roll out the vaccine. It is the Commonwealth government to provide quarantine. They have failed in their duty of care on both counts. We have, as Senator Seward has just uh, spoken about in her contribution, that there's been 23 breaches of hotel quarantine in um, a number of states, including New South Wales, West Australia, South Australia and Victoria. What we haven't seen from this government is any leadership when it comes to ensuring that there was an efficient, fast rollout of the vaccine. Now, we have known for some time in this place, because we have evidence of it every time we sit in this chamber, 
of a incompetent minister in Senator Colbeck when it comes to his responsibilities around aged care. What we saw was the Prime Minister remove a lot of his responsibility and put them over to Minister Hunt. Well, we've seen how well that has worked. And I'm sure that he just sees Senator Colbeck as a dispensable commodity in this place. Because if he really believed when he spoke the words that he was going to make aged care and aged care workers and older Australians a priority of his government in rolling out the vaccine, then he would never have left uh, Senator Colbeck in charge. He has been an embarrassment to this government, and I know that Australians generally have no faith in him as a minister when it comes to aged care. Now, Senator uh, Colbeck quite clearly, despite what Senator Henderson, who is a Victorian by the way, uh, denies that there needs to be an apology to the Victorian people, quite, it almost leaves me speechless that she could come into this place and try and shift the blame like the Prime Minister does, like all the ministers do, that the whole problem around the pandemic rests with the the Victorian Labor government. Well, it does not. The buck stops with the Prime Minister and his government when it uh, is a matter of rolling out the vaccine and when it comes to quarantine in this country. Now, we know, and I have the utmost respect for Jane Holton, a former secretary of the Department of Health, the Prime Minister's own, Captain Peak, uh, has made numerous comments and recommendations in relation to quarantine and what is needed in this country, and yet we still see uh, the government ignoring that advice. Well, quite frankly, if Senator Henderson in her contribution says that the vaccine is being rolled out at a fast rate, why is it then that we have less than 3 per cent of the Australian population that's been fully vaccinated? Heavens, I'd hate to see them if they were going at a slow pace. This is really frustrating for people who have relatives and friends and their loved ones in residential aged care. Because what we have seen is neglect by this government and in particular by uh, Senator Colbeck and his responsibility around aged care. And that is ensuring that not only were the aged care residents in these residential homes, have been fully vaccinated, and we know that they all haven't been. But he has failed in his duty to ensure that aged care workers have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. And they still don't know how many workers have, in fact, been vac vaccinated. But it's even worse than that, because knowing that we are still in this pandemic, knowing still that the virus is mutating around the world, and we have various uh, different versions now in Australia, they took away the supplement that was being paid to aged care workers in this country to ensure that they were not being forced to go and work across a number of sites, because we all know they're so lowly paid. And what did this government do? They stopped it. And yet the pandemic is still going. How irresponsible is that? Where is the leadership? Where is the strategy for ensuring that we get ahead of the game when it comes to rolling out the vaccines and getting ahead of this, this pandemic? They don't have one. They don't have one. And there's no way that anyone, including Senator Henderson, can come, come into this chamber and try and spin it because we know that they have failed in their basic duty of care to older residents in this country. Because we know of those older Australians who were in residential care that died, the virus was taken into those homes through workers. And what have they done to remedy that situation? They've taken away the supplement. They have not supported to the degree that they should with ensuring that aged care workers have been vaccinated. What we do believe is there might be some 9 per cent 
of the workforce that have been vaccinated. There's over 360,000 people working in aged care. So I've got to tell you, 9 per cent is not very many of them, and it isn't good enough. Quite frankly, people on that side of the chamber should be quite ashamed of their government's contribution when it comes to ensuring that Australians, and particularly older Australians and their workers and their carers, are, have been actually vaccinated. And we're not even talking about yet people in disability and their carers. But this government, as they always are, are so arrogant, they think they can just spin their way out of any situation. I have never in my lifetime, and I've been following politics since I was a, a young student in high school, I've never known a prime minister who will let the lies just slip off his lips as easy as this prime minister does on a daily basis. And the really sad thing is, I think he believes his own lies. I really do. He believes his own lies. And he is now being seen for the deceptive, very shonky prime minister that he is. And quite frankly, Senator, the Australian Senator people Polly. deserve so Senator much Polly. more. Uh, point of order over here. Order, uh, acting Chair, um, it is again standing orders to reflect on people both in this place and in the other place, and they are personal reflections, uh, and they should be withdrawn. I, I note there's been fairly robust debate in the chamber this afternoon. Senator, you might just want to clarify co comments and, and, and move on. Thank you very much, um, Acting Deputy uh, President. It is shocking, as a senator, have to come into this chamber and expose the shortcomings of the Prime Minister of this country. But I will come into this chamber every day and draw attention to the mismanagement and the lack of compassion and the lack of urgency in relation to us being able as a country to get ahead of the game when it comes to this pandemic. And quite frankly, the minister does owe the Victorian community an apology. And certainly the prime minister owes the Victorians an apology. But to have you know, the Prime Minister and other members of the government saying that this is not a race to roll out the vaccine, well, quite frankly, this is a race that we need to win. We need to get ahead of this virus. It is mutating to the extent that we don't know if there's any bounds to this. Therefore, we should be ensuring that the most vulnerable members of our community, whether they're older Australians, whether they're people with a disability, whether they're the people who are on the front line, they should have access as quickly as possible to ensure that we get ahead of this virus. But for this government to continually blame the states because they never want to accept any responsibility, the Prime Minister is being known as the Prime Minister who never takes responsibility. He's a Prime Minister who can't be trusted. Thank you, Senator Polly. I call Senator McKenzie. Thank you so much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, as a Victorian, as someone that uh, has seen my home state slowly come out of its fourth lockdown as a result of a state premier absolutely obsessed with power, uh, a, an approach, a totalitarian approach to running our state like I have never seen in this country. The facts are we face a global pandemic, and in about March last year, the Prime Minister rightly called all leaders in this country, himself as Prime Minister of the nation and every single one of our premiers and chief ministers, to discuss seriously as one nation how we were going to deal 
uh, with a global pandemic, uh, the likes of which we have not seen since the Spanish flu. And it was in that national cabinet that Premier McGowan, Labor Premier from WA, Premier Palaszczuk, the Labor Premier from Queensland, Chief Minister Barr, the Labor Chief Minister from the ACT, Chief Minister Gunner, the Labor Chief Minister from the NT, and Premier uh, Daniel Andrews, Premier of Danistan as we now know him, uh, all agreed at that uh, point. Senator McKenzie, please resume your seat. Point of order. Thank you, Madam Senator Ackie. Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. You've quite correctly ruled that uh, members should be referred to by their proper titles, and I'd ask that Senator McKenzie do the same. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator, what your, your your point is noted. Um, Senator Mackenzie, you wish to seek clarification on that point of order? Uh, I wish to make uh, a submission to the point of order. I was not referring to Premier Daniel Andrews, anything other than that title. My home state has, in fact, become known as Danistan. I so wasn't referring to Daniel Andrews Senator, by anything other than Senator his Mackenzie, name. If, if you can, Senator Mackenzie, if you, if you can just reflect on your comments and continue your contribution. Thank you. Well, thank you for your positive ruling in my case. Thank you, Chair. Uh, well, I wouldn't uh, want to characterise it in particularly uh, positive or negative. Senator McKenzie, Senator McKenzie, I cannot leave your comment un unnoted. Um, I seek that you don't uh, reflect on my ruling, that you accept it and you do, as I've asked you, to continue your comments, mindful of um, a decorous conversation on this matter of importance in the parliament. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam, Madam Deputy President. So, coming as I do from Dunestan, all of those Labor premiers and chief ministers agreed in March that they would take responsibility for quarantine and we would take responsibility for other aspects of dealing as a nation with a global pandemic. And you know what? Uh, you know, Premier McGowan has been tough on the borders, but you know what? Hasn't, doesn't hold a candle to Daniel Andrews' failures. Premier Palaszczuk, at least you can contact trace in Queensland. In Victoria, they cannot contact trace a zebra crossing Collins Street after 18 months. And so if you want to talk about where the failures in our system are in this country, I lay it firmly at the feet of the failures of ministers, from health ministers uh, right up to the Premier in my home state of Victoria, who, 18 months after the fact, have only one trick in their back pocket on how to uh, deal with outbreaks in my home state, and that is to lock everybody down. Everyone back on, put your masks back on, can't leave home, can't get married, can't bury your loved ones can't get elective surgery done, can't open your business. The latest lockdown, the first seven days, uh, cost regional Victoria $150 million. Just sounds like a number to people who don't care about small businesses, but these are people who've put their mortgages uh, on the line to run these businesses and have absolutely no certainty. And you know how confident people are in Dunestan about our state government's ability to manage uh, uh, the COVID-19. your seat. Point of order, Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I remind you. Well, I, I asked. I noted that you asked Senator McKenzie uh, to reflect on her language, and I can see that she's um, flagrantly ignoring you. And I'd ask that you bring her to order, please. Thank you. Uh, Oh, we're getting a little exercise here. Yes, Senator Sizelja. On the point of order, um, it's not clear to me at all uh, what the use of language by Senator McKenzie, how that could possibly breach a standing order. And if there is to be a ruling against Senator McKenzie, it would be good if that was clarified. Because on my reading of the standing orders, there is no standing order that is offended. Thank, thank you for your contribution there, um, Senator Sizelja. Can, can I just indicate to you, Senator McKenzie, that it is good practice to speak in plain English so that the people of the state might recognise that you are speaking to them? 
Um, and I encourage you to use the term Victoria. I'm assuming you are a proud senator of the state. It would be helpful if you could refer to it as Victoria um, going forward in the debate. Thank you. Our current malaise. I am a, a proud Victorian. And, and just, just to assure you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, that everyone in Victoria understands where we're talking about when we talk about Danistan. Uh, because we are actually Senator living in a totalitarian McKenzie, please take state. A seat. But Senator McKenzie, resume your seat. Yes, Senator Watt. I think you know what I'm going to say, Madam Acting Deputy President. I mean, the Senator keeps ignoring your, your requests. Um, she's making adverse reflections on uh, the Premier of another state. Um, and uh, I believe that I, sub I submit that that's unparliamentary language. Senator Watt, I'm ruling on Senator Watt's hearing. Madam First, I'll come to you in a moment, Senator McGrath. I trust me, I'll come to you. Senator Watt, your point is no. So, Senators, um, I, I did use the word decorous. I think that this has descended way past that. Um, Senator McKenzie, I, I think it's pretty clear that you know, this is a heated issue and it matters to everyone. It would be helpful if you could make a contribution that doesn't uh, ignore the general guidance that I'm attempting to give you. And I would ask senators if we could take the temperature down a little with regard to this debate. Uh, just, uh, Senator just McGrath. Just clarification. Is Danistan being ruled as unparliamentary? Senator McGrath. So it's, it's either... The senator can either say Danistan or cannot say Danistan. We, we need a ruling either way because Labor clearly are on slippery slope or slippery stairs indeed. Senator McGrath, uh, please take a seat. And just to be clear, there is no point of order. And if you wish to have a debate of that, I suggest you find another vehicle uh, to advance that in the no, parliament. Sorry, sorry, on the point of order, we just... Senator McGrath, we are moving on. There no, will be no further points of order on this particular matter. Senator McGrath, please take your seat. I call Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I do thank my colleagues for their support. It is like living in a gulag, living in Victoria for the last 18 months, where at any given moment this guy, because he cannot contact trace, because he's got a bureaucracy that's doing their best but doesn't have the systems in place, uh, is being locked down at a moment's notice in such a draconian way. When you've got other, and this isn't about Labor versus Liberal. This is not, because I, I praise Senator the Chief Boyd. Minister of the ACT, Ms. Chief Minister Barr, when he actually recognised that regional Victorians didn't carry the same COVID risk that someone from Melbourne might have at, at an earlier breakout. And so he sensibly applied a definition of a hotspot that was nuanced, that just wasn't this carte blanche, lock up and leave approach of Daniel Andrews in my home state. That is the reality. So for those to characterise how Victorian senators in this place feel about how our citizenry is being treated, how our economy is being decimated, how 26,000 people fled at the end of last year to other states to live. And if you had have seen the lineup of cars and four-wheel drives with tents stuffed in the back and caravans hitched on the back, families shoved in it so they could exit Melbourne as quickly as possible uh, at the, the start of the last lockdown, you would think you're in a third-world country and we're about to have a military coup. That is actually the reality, because none of these decisions are being made on medical advice. They are simply being made by an incompetent state government who cannot get its act together despite 18 months. And I will call once again for a nationally consistent approach to a definition of a hotspot. That would be great. A nationally consistent approach to handling quarantine and a consistent approach to contact tracing because Labor states have been able to keep themselves open 
Liberal states have been able to keep themselves open and going, but there is something decaying and wrong at the heart of the state Labor government in my home state of D ending with N. Um, that, that really you have to live there to understand what it feels like. And at the last, we have presentations to uh, hospitals and to specialists on mental health issues by young people, increasing upwards of 30 per cent as a result of this behaviour. We have elective surgeries, people in danger now uh, of not getting the health care they need because of uh, these restrictions. It is absolutely unprecedented, it is unwarranted, and it is simply because of their incompetence. And for those opposite to come in here from states not from that are having to endure this. this. This particular motion has been lodged by a Western Australian Labor senator, not even someone who's actually having to live with the reality of these decisions, uh, really gets on our goat. I mean, if you, if you had to go through it, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't believe it. Towns like Mildura, 550 clicks from Melbourne, had lockdown restrictions forced upon them despite recording zero cases, not zero cases this week, this month, this year, zero cases ever. But we're going to lock down your main street, we're going to stop you burying your loved ones, which we saw a tragic case in Warrnambool, a mother begging to have a funeral uh, for her primary school aged son down in Warrnambool, um, denied an exemption by a premier who cares more about uh, inducing Stockholm syndrome in his citizenry to secure the next election than he actually does yeah, good question than he actually does about the health, well-being and economic future of our once very proud state. We have you coming in here taking cheap political shots when you all know the Premier's made that decision. When you all know we've fast-tracked an MOU uh, for a federal quarantine facility uh, in Victoria, that we took that proposal from the Victorian Labor government, despite them not offering to put a cent on the table, I might add, uh, and you do that despite knowing we're doing everything and that the vaccine rate is actually accelerating every single million uh, group of Australians that are getting vaccinated uh, is happening quicker and quicker and quicker, which is great news, despite us stepping in with essential economic support for Victorian families and businesses. Um, you want to talk about all being in this, in this together? Well, I tell you, if you live in my home state of Danistan, it doesn't feel like we're all in this together. It feels like we are paying the price for a Premier drunk on power Drunk on, drunk on power, Senator Van. Drunk on power, uh, and that we've done the right thing in striking the balance. And I call on all leaders of this nation to develop a consistent approach to hotspots and quarantine, so Thank that we you. actually can Thank deal you, with the pandemic. Thank you, Senator And I call Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I agree with the need for ministers to apologise to Victorians and all Australians. This includes ministers from state governments, particularly Queensland, Victoria and Western Australia, and the federal government. But let's dive deeper. After 16 months, we still have virtually no data and certainly no plan. People are feeling scared, confused. Some are now terrified about the vaccine because crucial, uniform, crucial universal human needs are not being met. Needs like security, health, reassurance, confidence, honesty, leadership, direction, care and competence. Where is the plan for managing this virus and managing our economy? The inconsistent behaviour across states and nationally reveals no plan. Queensland, Victoria and WA have deepened fear and confusion. Ministers are lurching from event to event, crisis to crisis. The people have been abandoned and there is just confusion and lack of accountability. There are seven strategies for managing a virus, and I have checked this with the Chief Medical Officer and the, Sec and the Secretary of the Department of Health. First one is isolation or lockdowns. The World Health Organization admits that this is used only in limited use to get control. So lockdowns are now an admission 
that they don't have control of their states, the state governments. They're not managing the virus. The virus is managing the states. We see now in Victoria 184 per cent increase in attempted suicides from children—184. Lockdowns are failing. Secondly, testing, tracing, quarantine. This is partially in use, but to very poor standards. The third, third uh, factor of strategy is restrictions, things like masks and social distancing, capricious and dubious of benefit. The fourth one, vaccines. We now have deaths from vaccines, thousands of people dying overseas from vaccines. We have a wide variety of side effects, from blood including blood clots, and the health minister himself has been uh, hospitalised with cellulitis as a side effect. The chief medical officer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration and the head of the Federal Department of Health refuse to declare the vaccines 100 per cent safe. And the vaccines fail to prevent transmission. The fifth factor, cures and prophylactics. Ivermectin. I took it in, in 2014. There have been 3.7 billion doses around the world over six decades. It's proven safe. It's cheap because it's off patent, and it's now being proven successful, highly successful, overseas. We have 655 aged care residents have died, and yet this drug is available, proven and safe. The two other factors that I won't go into. The main point is there's no plan and governments lurch from event to event, issue to issue. They're making it up as they go. Premiers and prime ministers hide behind health officers. Australians have had enough of the fear, the fear mongering and the spin. Australians need honest, responsible, competent leadership. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Roberts. I call Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, look, it is quite amazing when you've just someone to just tune in. Uh, on one hand, state governments have been accused of making up the virus, and on the other hand, we're getting accused of going too hard and trying to protect you know the citizens, whether they are from Victoria and our good state, Senator Van. Uh, and, and, and Patterson, or from any other state around the country. I mean, governments have an obligation right around this country to make sure that they protect their citizens. You know, this is a new phenomenon that we're all trying to live through. Um, and quite frankly, the contributions from, our, from some on the other side um, really, I feel like, are very juvenile. And saying that we're not trying to politicise the issue, well, sorry, but some others on the other side are being political about the issue. Trying to say that you know, the state government down in Victoria somehow just wakes up one morning and decides, oh, we just want to shut down the state because you know, we can do so. No one wants to shut down their state. No one wants to shut down their economy. But quite frankly, every state government has had to make decisions, including the federal government. Let's not forget, Prime Minister Morrison invited all the state premiers to come together around a concept called the National Cabinet. The National Cabinet set down the rules in place around how we would manage the lockdown and other factors as a result of COVID. So let's just all take a bit of a deep breath. I know, um, you know our great state of Victoria, we've had uh, quite a few challenges over the last 12 to 18 months, but nonetheless, we are managing. We are managing through those issues. And quite frankly, we have shown the rest of the world that how our, our Commonwealth integrates with our state governments, we are living quite frankly, in paradise compared to the rest of the world. Do we want to compare to how we are going over in the UK or over in the rest of Europe or the United States or Asia or Africa? Because, quite frankly, I wouldn't rather be anywhere else than here in Australia right now. So when Senator Stirl puts forward a motion, I think we all just need to read the words of what he was after. And it was around the, the, the comments that the minister, the minister for Senior Australians and Aged Care and Services made no one else but what the minister said. You know, there was a very positive record across, across the board with respect to maintain a safe border for Australia. That's what he was claiming. Now, what we are saying is that, that the minister has misrepresented this place. And time and time again, when we have put questions to him, whether it be here in question time or in estimates, he hasn't been able to provide a straightforward answer. Having to go through his pack or not being able to provide simple, simple answers to questions, how many people have been vaccinated, Minister? Cannot even get a simple answer. And we heard that today from another minister in this place when I asked a couple of minister, uh, questions to the minister uh, for the NDIS. How many people have been vaccinated who have been in a home under the care of, um, of organisations that are looking after those with a disability? 
and the minister wasn't able to even provide a straightforward answer, especially not understand the difference between Group 1A or Group 1B. So before we all get in here, beating our chests, saying, you know, what a, a bad job some of our state governments have been doing, I think we all need to have a look at, this, at ourselves and say, have we all been doing a good job? And can we make this situation better for everyone? And I'm sure Senator Van will have a contribution later on, given he's a cheeky grin across the aisle. But look, as a nation, we do find ourselves you know, 12 months into this health event. And we are still waiting, though, sadly, for the government, the federal government, to step up, in my opinion, and take more responsibility around quarantine. So there's been the two issues that Labor has been pushing this government hard on, having a national consistent quarantine system around the country and making sure that Australians right around the country take up the vaccination to a level that we can then start to slowly open up our economy. Because until we get to that point, we are going to be in this scenario where we will have constant challenges about what do we do when there is an outbreak. You know, and, and recent reports uh, in the last couple of hours suggesting that New South Wales is now having a, a, a small outbreak down in the south of Sydney. There may be another one in Queensland. So before we start taking cheap pot shots here at Victoria, let's also just remember that there are other states that will have to grapple with the issue as, as soon as we start opening our economy. And ultimately, that is all that we want in this place. We want to protect our economy because the sooner that we can get out of this mess, the sooner that we can start creating more jobs and start having better outcomes for people right around the nation. Thank you, Senator Ciccone. I call Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I love MPIs because it's just exactly what we always expect from Labor. They're going to throw some Dorothy Dixes at us that we can come back and, and show just how political they are going to be. And while my good friend, Senator Cody, says the cheap shots. There's nothing cheaper than this MPI today. There's nothing cheaper. We have a very safe record, mostly in Australia. But, however, as he said, I would probably have something to say about what the media have called Danistan and have, on many, many occasions, the media have called Danistan. So I think my good friend, Senator. Uh, Mackenzie had every right to, to use that, that language. Now, Senator Ciccone was right about one thing. The states came together under national cabinet and they agreed that the states would run hotel quarantine for very good reasons. They agreed it because they have primary responsibility for the quarantine arrangements under their public health legislation. This enables those jurisdictions to best manage their public health response. And why? Well, Senator Ciccone mentioned Senate estimates. And our chief medical officer said quite clearly in Senate estimates just earlier this month um, that the, um, this, the, this is clearly that hotel quarantine was made was clearly a public health matter. And that was why the decision was made, that decision being the states run that. And it's probably the most important thing that we've done in relation to keeping Australia safe since that time. And he went on to say that there's a lot of questions we've had in this committee and others about types of quarantine. But the key important part, Senator Ciccone, is you get public health issues right. And he went on to say the public health workforce sits in the states. My colleagues, he said, on HPPC have ample and very experienced people to do that work and that is why they chose to do it. Since hotel quarantine measures were implemented, we're talking about an MPI about keeping our borders safe, over 358,000 international air arrivals have come into hotel quarantine. And among those international air arrivals, there's been an estimated 3,900 COVID cases, the majority of which were detected in hotel quarantine. This represents approximately 1.1 per cent of all international air arrivals that, had, that, were, that became COVID-19 positive. Now, out of those, only six of those have gone on 
to be on the household of the person, either worker or someone who has been released from quarantine. And again, I'm quoting our CMO, Professor Paul Kelly, that six out of 3,900 positive cases. That's an extraordinary record of how we have managed our borders. Managed quarantine has been Australia's first line of defence. And Professor Kelly went on to say hotel quarantine was the key, the most key, I'd say, ring of containment. But where did those cases go, those six that went out there? Well, they started going on to other things. And how have states managed where cases have got out of hotel quarantine? Well, that job is down to contact tracing. And that's where my home state, the one that the media called Danistan, has failed miserably. And every time, every sitting period last year, I challenged my Victorian Senate colleagues to talk about what was happening in Danistan. They never once said a word about lockdown. They never once said a word about hotel quarantine. They never once said a word about the failures of contact tracing. Now let's just look at the empirical evidence here. Australia has had, and I think this is pretty close to accurate as of today, 30,274 cases. Victoria had 20,668 cases. That was 68 per cent of cases in Victoria. Australia had, sadly, 910 deaths. Victoria had 820 of those deaths. That's 90 per cent of deaths due to COVID happened in Victoria. That empirical evidence shows a failure in my home state, my very proud home state, the one that the media call Danistan. Thank you, Senator Van. The time for discussion has expired. Senator McKim.